Let us open our Bibles to the third chapter of the Sayings of the Wise, the book of Proverbs. Our reading from chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. The apparent simplicity of these verses is belied by the rich vocabulary and the deep symbolism. So please do not prejudge what we might find in these verses. Let us excavate them and come to understand deeply what these texts mean. Our reading, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his infallible word. The Hebrew Bible is categorically divided into three parts, the law or the Torah, the prophets, which in the mind of the Hebrews included the historical books, they were books of history with prophetic intent. And then lastly, the third category, the writings. And the writings include the wisdom literature, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon. Some include the book of Daniel in the writings and in the wisdom literature. But actually, in our English Bibles, Daniel appears among the prophets. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, for example. In the teachings of Jesus... He derived much of his doctrine from these different sections of the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. For example, in Matthew chapter 5, as he gives the Sermon on the Mount, he develops in deep and rich manner the intent of the Torah He says, for example, that you have heard it said, Thou shalt not murder. But I say unto you, Whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever calls his brother a fool shall be in danger of the fire of hell. So, What we have is our Lord taking that section of the Bible, one of the three, the Torah, and explicating and expounding and deeply giving the profound spiritual sense of the Torah. He does the same with the prophets. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, our Lord says, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. This is only one example of where he follows the prophetic tradition. And throughout the Gospels, we have him deriving from the prophetic tradition deep and rich teachings. And so, as he does from the Torah, so he does from the prophets... It will not surprise us then that he often derives much of his teaching and specifically his teaching about giving from the writings. And so therefore we have in the wisdom literature our Lord taking from that wisdom literature aphorisms, weighty statements, parables, lessons about life, And then 
human examples. These three categories appear in the wisdom literature. And so the sense of what we've learned already is that from each of the sections of the Old Covenant, Jesus derives much of his teaching. And specifically, our concern is with examples from his teaching from the wisdom literature. Let's take, for example, his aphorisms. These are weighty and wise sayings. The first is an example, Luke chapter 10 and verse 7, where he says, the laborer is worthy of his wages. It's derived from a wisdom-like reciprocal manner that is in keeping with the Proverbs. In Luke chapter 6, we have another wise saying that is akin to the wisdom literature. The Lord says there concerning giving, he says, give and it will be given to you. And then he gives a simple example of that by illustrating with a bushel basket how we are to give. And he says, when you bring a bushel basket, push it down, pour in more until it overflows. A simple illustration of what we would call generous giving. Rather than reducing the bushel basket, he counsels his disciples to include all that they possibly can in their giving. And they will be reciprocated. He says the measure with which you measure is the measure by which God will measure you. So if we are sparse and meager as a disciple of Christ in our giving, then God may reciprocate us with sparseness and a meager amount. So it's wisdom literature extricated from the tradition of the writings. Then the parables. There we find in Luke chapter 12 the very famous parable of the rich fool. And all of us know the story well. And this individual who is wealthy amasses for himself and makes every effort to make certain that his future is prosperous and wealthy. And then his life is taken from him. And we have the Lord addressing him specifically in the words of the Proverbs. He calls this man a fool. And the three categorizations of fool in the book of Proverbs are the Hebrew words pithy, casil, and late. One is the naive simpleton who simply knows nothing. His eyes are in the ends of the earth. The other is a casil, an individual who acknowledges the theoretical existence of God and even acknowledges the Torah but is disinclined to obey it and rejects the counsel of God. And then the lates is the individual who is a scorner or a mocker who views God's words and God himself with derision. And the Lord here, now that we have eyes to see that he is deriving this from wisdom literature, our Lord takes this word casil and he indicates that a person who is who amasses for himself or herself is a casil, is a fool, is a person who has not taken God's counsel into consideration. And he a- ends that parable in Luke chapter 12 with saying that we are to be rich toward God. Chapter 16, another parable. Our Lord teaches us about the unjust steward. And moving quickly to the conclusion, our Lord uses him as an example of an individual who is shrewd and wise. Again, a theme of the Proverbs. And this individual who is shrewd and wise makes provision for himself very carefully. But the Lord then observes 
that the sons of this world are wiser in their generation than the sons of light. In other words, people of the world extend great effort and insight into providing for themselves, but the sons of light fail to invest properly in eternal matters. They're not savvy. They're not wise. They don't invest in eternal matters as they should. Once again now, two aphorisms and two parables derived from the literature of the writings. And then lastly, two examples where we have in the book of Proverbs examples of individual conduct that are to be instructive to us. And our Lord also borrows this category from the Proverbs. Luke chapter 21, for example, where our Lord uses a poor widow, the widow, the most economically vulnerable in society, and Jesus is observing the individuals coming into the temple and placing their gifts in the trumpet-shaped receptacles that were in the court of the women. And the Lord sees her put in two small copper coins. And he comments, this woman has put in all that she has. And so here it is not generous but extravagant and sacrificial giving that the Lord uses from an illustration in real life. The other example our Lord uses is in John chapter 12, where Mary of Bethany takes a container, one translation says a pint, of pure nard, an extremely expensive perfume, and she breaks the container and pours the entirety of the contents onto his feet and then wipes his feet with her hair. And the Lord commends her, though Judas Iscariot notes, he says this could have been sold and the money given to the poor. Her extravagant giving was such that this is a whole year's wages that she has poured out in his mind uselessly upon the Lord's feet. I hope you won't feel that this has been too long to explain the simple point, that Jesus derives teachings for his disciples from the wisdom literature. So it's not surprising at all that when we come directly to those texts of wisdom literature, the book of Proverbs, that we find that it is full of exquisite sayings that give us instruction on how to be wise. So let's move now, understanding that our Lord was thoroughly acquainted with the implications of wisdom literature, that he used it in his teachings, both with aphorisms, parables, and illustrations from real life. And this means that when we come to the Proverbs themselves, we might expect that their simplicity belies a deep and rich teaching. So let's take our Lord's example and the conclusion that we might expect much more from what appears to be a simple text than at first meets the eye. So let us look at Proverbs Verses chapter 3, verses 3 and 9. And the first matter of investigation, naturally, is with the first word that is used in verse 9. It says, honor the Lord. The word honor is used over 300 times in the Old Testament. There are two dozen examples of it in the book of Proverbs. But it has a specific natural meaning. It means heavy, 
or weighty, possessing great weight, or being heavy. For example, for Samuel, the Bible tells us there that Eli, the priest, was very heavy. And it refers literally to his physical, physical stature. He was a, a, a very heavy man. And our word for honor is used in a natural sense there. Eli was extremely heavy. And then we have it in 2 Samuel where somewhat interestingly, Absalom is said to have heavy hair, that his hair was heavy. In other words, he had a lar more than just a large shock of hair. He had extremely long hair that was bushed out, as it were, and as weights come and go, his hair was heavy. And so as the author of Proverbs is using this word, he is ascribing to God heaviness or weight in the manner in which he gives from his substance. It's important to know that when it says honor the Lord from your wealth, that the word wealth does not necessarily indicate that the one who is receiving instruction is is wealthy, the word simply means substance. So, for example, in the King James Version, the Bible says, honor the Lord with your substance. It simply means one's income and possessions, what one owns. And so, the verb indicates that the way in which one views God will be reflected in the way that the believer or the disciple honors God or gives to God. In other words, specifically, if one attributes weight and heaviness to God, if God in their estimate is, and in their appraisal, and in their estimation, if God is weighty and heavy, substantial, they will respond to him from their substance by giving with substance, with weight, with um, heaviness. So the verse is teaching us, first of all, that a wise man, one who fears the Lord for the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, that a person who is wise that a person who rightly values God as heavy and weighty will therefore honor the Lord from his substance with healthy or having heavy giving. So that we might put it this way even. How does the reader of the text value God? Is he High and lifted up? Is he infinite, eternal, unchangeable? Is he the majestic rock and redeemer? Is he the sovereign creator and Lord? And an individual who sees God as weighty, as the ultimate substantial being, that individual then valuing God in that way will give and honor God in that way so that we might even put it this way. Do we have or does the reader have a view of God that we would call heavyweight? God is weighty. He's the dread sovereign. He's the sovereign Lord. He is the Savior. He is the only redeemer of God's elect. And so the individual's valuation, the individual's appraisal of God is going, to, is going to affect whether or not that individual's giving is heavyweight or an individual who dishonors God is one who doesn't see God as weighty or heavy or substantial and therefore his or her giving is lightweight. So when our church makes 
our pledges, that pledge very much, given, given the ordinary circumstances of life, that pledge very much is an example of how that individual values God and his church. If God and his church are of precious and high value, that is, they are heavy and weighty, then an individual's valuation of God and his church is going to result in a heavy weight pledge. But an individual who is blasé about God's church is not, does not prize the means of grace and word and sacrament, does not view God in his theocentric glory as particularly important in their life, an individual who discounts the heavy valuation and weight of God is going to, in that sense, dishonor or devalue God by not giving according to his substantial weight and heaviness. So if God is prized and valued and heavy, then from our substance, our pledge is going to represent that personal appraisal of what we think about God and his church. Again, if it's not a significant matter, if days pass by without one thinking of God and the kingdom which Christ bought by his blood, it's just not that significant. And so the pledge is going to reflect that. It's going to reflect a lightweight view of God and his church. But for one who values that, as the highest grace in life and recognizes God as the incalculable, heavy and weighty persona of the Holy Trinity, that individual is going to make a valuation and that pledge will reflect the valuation that that individual has of God. And so the first line of the first verse teaches us this matter. It is an individual who has a covenant relationship with God. The word Lord is the God of the covenant. And that individual is going to place high, the highest value on what he or she perceives God to be. Substantial, heavy, and weighty, or a very lightweight response in pledge because the church and God's kingdom really is not that weighty in that individual's sight. So it's not really that simple a statement. It's calling upon us to make evaluation of God in his church and then to give accordingly. Heavy because God is weighty or light because we do not have a high valuation of God in Christ and his unsearchable riches. So the vocabulary is extremely important. In the teachings of Jesus to his disciples, wisdom literature is used. Here, similarly, wisdom literature is assessing us what is valuable, heavy, and weighty in our life, God or other considerations. Let's move to the second line. Now, to properly expound that line, we need to understand one simple matter about Hebrew poetry. Many of you know this already because we've talked about it, in previous years, but Proverbs, of course, is poetry. It is, it, it, it is what we call characterized. Hebrew poetry is characterized by what is called parallelism. That is to say, very simply, that the two lines are parallel in meaning to one another so that words can be synonyms, and so we might, if we wanted to express ourselves carefully, 
if we wanted to express ourselves even profoundly, one of the ways we do that is to multiply synonyms. Uh, we won't say, that movie was great. We'll use several synonyms to say how much we enjoyed the movie. We'll say, that movie was outstanding. That movie was stupendous. That was the best movie. So we take synonyms, words with similar meanings, and we multiply them so that they will affect the listener. We want that listener to know that this was no ordinary movie. This was a movie that was spectacular. And so we employ synonyms, often in multiplicity, to communicate to the listener our sense of how we perceived the movie. Well, it's the same thing in Hebrew parallelism. The author is going to use one line to declare how important our valuation of God is. And then so that we are clear on what he means, he is going to use another line that is parallel to the first. And it's called synonymous parallelism parallelism, that the two lines are really synonyms of meaning. So here, knowing that characteristic, and it is really a very simple feature of Hebrew poetry, we are going to expect in line two a similar sentiment to what we have in verse one. The author is going to tell us something not once with one line, but in verse 9, he's going to tell us something twice because he wants to emphasize it. So line 1, how we value God and our appraisal of God and how we respond to God with our giving is the first line. But the second line draws not so much from vocabulary as from symbolism. So the author in this synonymous parallel line is going to give us now not simply a rich vocabulary, but is going to give us a symbol from the agricultural world of the reader. And in that agricultural world that was common to those who read this wisdom literature in its earliest context. It was, of course, an agricultural, an agrarian society, and valuations were often made on the basis of a crop. So when one had a crop, for example, then the Torah, the law, says that the individual's crop is to be tithed to God. And we saw last week, and it's simple a matter of, of a dic consulting a dictionary or a lexicon, that tithe does not mean some indiscriminate amount or a don donation, a tithe. The tithe literally means to give a tenth. And so the Old Testament, whether Abraham giving a tenth to Melchizedek or the children of Israel giving a tenth to the Levites and the priests to provide for the tabernacle and its function, that the tithe was taken from what we call income, the produce of the land for the year. So that's a category that was common. To give a tenth was established in Israel as in keeping with the explicit commandment of God. And that's why you have last week where Malachi is a prophet invades against the people for not complying with what we might call the law of God. But remember, that teaching on the law and giving a tenth was last week. Our consideration this week is with Jesus' preoccupation with wisdom, which commends us to looking at the wisdom literature itself. And we've seen through rich vocabulary in the first line that it is intensely expressive. It 
shines a searchlight on us and asks us, though God is in covenant with us, do we value him highly? And if we do, our giving will be heavy and waiting. Now he's using symbolism from the agricultural fields, and he uses the word, not tithe, but he uses the word first fruits. Here is a critical step. First fruits to many unknowing Christians is equated with the tithe. In other words, when uh, many believers read uh, of the first fruits, they simply in, in, infer that the first fruits must be the tithe. And they, these are indeed viewed to be as synonyms. So when one gave a tenth, one was giving the first fruits. That is entirely incorrect. And it misses the deep symbolism that this wisdom literature is communicating to its audience. The first fruits was not a percentage, and it was not important as far as percentage. The significance of the first fruits was twofold. First, as the individual's crop came to fruition, they would take a small portion, a sheath of the crop, and they were instructed to take that small, almost minuscule amount and to present it to the Lord as indication that all belong to him. In other words, the giving of the first fruits was not a percentage, but was a symbolic expression on the part of the worshiper that he or she recognized that all that the believer possesses belongs to God and that God is simply requiring, in addition to a tithe, God is simply requiring them to symbolically act out the fact, indicating by their action of bringing the first fruit that God indeed was the owner of everything, and this first fruit is symbolic that the worshiper recognizes that. So we have in the Jewish Talmud, which is a compilation of Jewish um, rabbinical thought, we have the rabbis puzzled over really how much the first fruit was. And they come to the conclusion in the Talmud that the amount of the first fruit, again, was incalculable and was relatively insignificant in amount. One rabbi says that the symbolic first fruit was one sixtieth of the projected crop. Remember, this sheath is being taken first before the individual consumes the harvest or before the individual puts the harvest on the market. The very first thing before consumption or sale, the very first thing is to symbolically acknowledge that all belongs to God. And that is the intent of the first fruit. What this means specifically in a simple manner of speaking is priority. That the first thing one who is in covenant with God will do is to make this symbolic act first. So that what we would say is that giving under this symbol of the first fruits is the believers who is in covenant with God, that this is the first priority of the worshiper. So that we can use a, an example from modern secular financial counseling. Now, I'm sure, I think probably all of us 
have at one time or another listened to uh, uh, talk shows that have as their featured topic financial counsel, financial advice. And uh, it's clear from the book market in America that people are extraordinarily interested in receiving financial counsel. So they'll turn into a talk show that has financial advice and it will go from stocks and bonds to pension plans to all kinds of intricacies of what is deemed to be wise economic counsel. And the books are sold in high quantities. People are highly interested. And in fact, some of this may be helpful, but that's not our particular point. Our point is that in this financial counseling, it is often stated that one should pay oneself first. Most of us have heard this phrase, pay yourself first. In other words, the counsel is that with your income, as a check comes in, you, you, the first thing you do if you're going to acquire financial resources in the future, if you're going to become wealthy, if you're going to um, uh, make economic progress, the first thing you do before you pay your bills, before you do anything, before you have any other action, you pay yourself 10%. And this is so common that I think most of us have heard it. Then the, the advice ordinarily goes on. Then you make sure you're in your uh, profit sharing plan where you work, that you have so much allocated to an IRA, whether Roth or, or traditional, and so forth. But the point of this financial counsel is that the priority is you. that the first check you write is to yourself because ultimately that's the priority in your life. But symbolically and clearly what the author is saying in this synonymous parallelism, parallelism is that the first thing you do is to pay God the tenth. So that the imagery of this figurative act of symbolic priority is emphasized in the synonymous parallelism of line two. So in the first line, you value God as immeasurably great as the high and holy one. And your giving will reflect your evaluation of God. In the second place, the author skillfully, using the common device of synonymous parallelism, is elaborating on that and saying, not only are you to have a high evaluation of God and therefore give to God in a heavy or weighty manner, but you are to do that first. That is the first thing that you are to do. We might even say it this simply. The first check we write is to God as we highly value him. It's not to ourselves or it's not to another particular entity or savings vehicle or whatever. All of those things are undoubtedly um, important things in life if we're able to do that. But what wise individuals do and that is what wisdom literature is doing. A wise individual who fears the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, will write his or her first check to the Lord. And he goes on here to say, from the first of all your produce, honor the Lord. The Lord is the first check. The Lord is the highest valuation. And in these two ways of communicating, the Bible is telling us what the tithe tells us from the perspective of the law, 
the proverb is telling us from the perspective of wisdom. There are two different points to consult. Am I giving the tenth, which is what the tithe means? Am I valuing God highly and therefore the offering and the pledge is also weighty and heavy? And am I making this a priority in my life or do, do we just do what was often done in the fields of Israel? Leave the gleanings. And by leaving the gleanings, it meant simply this, that the first thing that you did with your crop was to take for yourself, to make sure that you and your family have adequate resources physically and materially. The second thing you do is after you have consumed your portion of the crop, you put that crop up for sale and you sell. So first is consumption, second is income. You put the crop out for sale. And then what's left in the field can go to the Lord. You've consulted yourself first, you've given the crop on the market, the futures is good for crops, you sell into the futures market, and you receive income. And then what's left in the field, you then you'll consider God. And so actually, in symbolic language, the synonymous parallelism holds true. He is essentially saying, again, if you value your covenant relationship with God, if you value God most highly, it's going to be the first thing you do. It's not going to be second or third. It's going to be the first thing you do. So we boiled this proverb down to weight and priority. How weighty is God and is God a priority? Now verse 10 is simple and we'll move through this quickly. However, I don't want to take it completely in isolation because it represents what appears to be a consistent pattern of teaching throughout the Bible. And that is that when an individual construes God as weighty, and as a result of that evaluation makes a weighty gift to God, and because that individual views God as first, and therefore the priority is first the percentage that belongs to God, when an individual does that, in this particular wisdom context, the indication is that God will respond to that evaluation and to that sense of priority, and God will reciprocate with generosity. So that, in verse 10, the simple allegorical, excuse me, the simple analogous teaching is in two lines again. Your barns will be filled with plenty. Your vats, that is you store the liquid olive oil or wine, will overflow with new wine. Now, is this an isolated promise of sorts? Well, no, because we find it in the other forms of literature in the Bible. For example, just last week, we saw that the Philippians gave repeatedly. They gave generously so that Paul could say they were paid in full. And then at the conclusion of that section we studied last week, in verse 19, Paul says, My God will supply all your, rich, all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus or according to his glory in Christ Jesus. In other words, Paul has said very simply, you have provided for God's work. God is now going to provide for you. So there's this sense of divine reciprocity that as God is highly valued and God is put first, that God himself is going to respond to that believer and that believer is going to, in the words of verse 10, is going to have an abundant crop. So it's not simply in the wisdom literature, it's in the epistles of the New Testament. Then we also saw in Malachi chapter 3, 
Individuals were robbing God. They were not giving God a tenth. The prophet goes to them and says, if you will bring the full tithe, the whole tithe into the storehouse, God is going to reciprocate that. He is going to open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing which you cannot contain. So we have the prophets and we have the wisdom literature and we have the epistles of the New Testament colluding, if you will, here in indicating to the believer that when God is ultimate in our estimate, When God is first in our estimate and when we respond that way financially to the needs of his kingdom and to the percentage that God requires, when we do those things, God himself reciprocates the believer by providing for him or for her. So we have, in a sense, what we might call the wisdom literature as formulaic. And by formulaic, we simply mean according to a formula. You recognize the value and the priority. God reciprocates by blessing. And incidentally, probably what undergirds verses 9 and 10 is Deuteronomy chapter 28. And Deuteronomy chapter 28 is the blessings of the covenant. And one of the blessings of the covenant in response to the people's obedience is that God will care for them. And so this is sort of distilled wisdom and knowledge that is based on the covenant reciprocity that as one fulfills one's covenant obligations to God, then God himself responds by providing for the believer. Now, I have one word to interpret and we're through. It's the word peroration. Most of you know it, but I want to make sure that we understand the point of it. In classical rhetoric studies, a peroration was the part of the rhetorical speech in which the individual giving the persuasive speech exhibits a dramatic rhetorical flourish at the end of the speech. So that if we break down a speech, for example, we could look at introduction, content, and then in classical rhetoric from Greece and Rome, the individual was taught to then deliver a peroration. This was a flourishing and rhetorical extravagance means of ending with a double pronunciation mark. An example of that, one of the, one of the uh, most well-known in American speech is what Patrick Henry said at the end of he gives a dramatic speech about the colonies being independent of Great Britain. And then in a peroration, that is a dramatic flourish at the end and the conclusion of the speech, He says in dramatic way, in a dramatic way, with a gesticulation sweeping his hand over his heart, he says, Give me liberty or give me death. That's a peroration. That that's a a, a convincing rhetorical flourish at the end of the content that seals the deal that brings the individuals who are listening to concur with the speaker and to take action on the basis of that speaker. And what I want to say to you, I'm addressing to you because you are my dear friends and ladies and gentlemen, our stewardship and commitment Sundays do not have a peroration. By that I mean tactfully and intentionally, what I'm going to ask is a simple appeal of courtesy based on the information that we have received from the Bible. And that is the appeal is this, that as we make 
our pledges. We place the highest evaluation upon our estimate and appraisal of God Himself. And that as a result, what we give in our pledge will reflect our high valuation of God. Secondly, that that will be the priority. That giving to God and His church will be the priority. And it's a simple request by one gentleman to ladies and gentlemen from a brother to brothers and sisters to communicants as a fellow communicant. And that we very simply not respond to a dramatic rhetorical flourish we simply respond to the biblical data that gives us from Jesus and from the wisdom literature such a pristine and clear view of our obligations of God to be ultimate and to be first. And when we do that, God will provide not only for us, but God will provide for us. That is the appeal. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to courteously explain what the one who fears God, the, the wise man or woman, will do and the evaluations they will make and the priorities that they will set. And so, Lord, we leave this scriptural evidence, this biblical data, with brothers and sisters, friends in Christ, ladies and gentlemen of the church, and we ask that I and we would respond with generous sacrificial giving that will reflect our obedience to being disciples of Christ and our being wise men and women as those who fear the Lord. Thank you that you have given us evidential teaching that in response to our response, you will care for us. We place all of our church families and then our church family into your care, in the strong name of Jesus, amen.